We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like you to join me in reading that Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Most Bible students will say that is the theme of the Acts of the Apostles. I prefer the simple theme, the gospel goes from Jerusalem to Rome. Now, you can't really say the Acts of the Apostles goes into all the world, because it doesn't get beyond the, the Mediterranean world. But that was the Roman Empire. And you know, the Romans said, we are the world. We are all the world. So what we're going to find here as we study the Acts of the Apostles is that the gospel goes from where Jesus started and as we just read, Jerusalem, Samaria, go into Galilee, go into Asia Minor, go into Italy. So if we want to put them all on the map, most Bibles will have that map of the what is called the four missionary journeys of Paul. But what I also noticed is Paul doesn't come along till you get to about, oh, what is it, the 11th chapter. So the first 10 chapters basically take place in Jerusalem, and Peter is the hero of those opening chapters. Then the conversion of the apostle Paul on his way to Damascus, and from there on, it seems like Luke travels with Paul and he writes the gospel as we went, then we boarded, then we arrived. And whenever we come in Acts of the Apostles to a, a we sentence, you know that Luke was an eyewitness of what he's writing about. Let me give you just a little bit of a background. If you've got Acts chapter 1 verse 1, the author of Acts is obviously the same as the author of the Gospel of Luke. It's Luke. He says, I'm writing to you, Theophilus, and this is sort of the second Luke. You could call this the Gospel according to Luke, second book, or volume two, because chapter 24 of Luke ends with the ascension. And now... What you have here is the beginning of Acts with the ascension, but a lot more details. So in a certain sense, you could say what we have here looks like Luke wrote to Theophilus. That's a Latin name in this, the way it's written, but it's actually in context theos and philos are Greek words. So Theophilus could very well have been a Greek. We think Luke was a Greek. He wasn't a Jew, he was a Gentile. And he wrote to Theophilus so he would know all the things that Jesus did. And then it seems like a couple years later, maybe as many as ten years later, he comes across Theophilus who's a believer now. And he writes the Acts of the Apostles to say... Look how successful the gospel is. It's going out into all the world. Let me tell you a few things that we learned right here at the beginning. It's things we actually talked about when we were, um, when we were studying the gospel of Luke. The author of the Acts of the Apostles is the same as that of Luke. If you wanted to compare it to Luke chapter 1, you'd see he's writing to Theophilus, of all the things that Jesus began to do. You know what he could have done? He could have said, I'm writing this Acts to you to show you what Jesus is continuing to do. Because that's kind of the way they work. The one is with Jesus as the center. The other is Jesus is the message as the center of what's going on. He was a fellow worker and companion of the Apostle Paul. He seems to have met Paul about the year 51, which would suggest 
that he didn't write the gospel until after he was converted by the Apostle Paul in 51. We'll talk a little bit later about the date of 62 that for the writing of Acts of the Apostles, and I'll tell you why. Luke was a Gentile. We think he was converted in Antioch, and with the persecution of the Jews in Jerusalem, Antioch became a very important uh, starting point for most missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. Barnabas was sent from Antioch to Cyprus. So the church at Antioch would be very mission-minded. They had a resolution passed at convention to open 10 new missions for the next 10 years. Oh no, that wasn't, that wasn't Antioch. Nobody caught on to that. <laughs> While Paul moved south to, Achaia, to Greece, he set Luke as pastor in Philippi. I should look and see if you have most of that, right? He rejoined Paul when Paul revisited Philippi on his third missionary journey, Acts chapter 20. He was an educated man with a definite Greek bent of mind. Now, the Greeks were very logical. You've heard of Homer and Socrates and Demosthenes. These were the, the experts. Uh, Hippocrates, the doctor, was a Greek. So Greek was organized wisdom. The Romans were practical wisdom. Law, the Senate, voting, democracy. So Greek and Romans put together give us our American standards. Uh, in many, many ways. We get quite a few words out of Latin and Greek, too. The Apostle Paul called him a, my beloved physician. Now, the word physician could have been simply a very educated man, like we use the word doctor. Somebody goes off to college and gets the high degree. He's a doctor of law. He's a doctor of philosophy. Or he may be, have been a medical doctor. And that would make sense. Because remember Paul talks about his, his, uh, his thorn in the flesh. Some kind of a physical ailment that kept him from doing as much as he wanted to do. And yet look at what the Apostle Paul uh, accomplished. So maybe Luke was, was his doctor. Later when Paul is in Rome waiting trial before Caesar, Luke was in Rome. It's very possible. Luke wrote this letter to Theophilus while he was in Rome. And that would then give us the date. Is that a blank? I think that's a blank in your thing. If you want to write it in. The date of the writing is most likely after the year 61, when Paul first left Jerusalem on his way to Rome, and the year 64, when Nero burned down the city of Rome and burned, uh, blamed the Christians, and we think both Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome in 64. So most commentators are going to suggest the date of writing was 62. And then you can say, give or take a year. See, see, scholars like to do that. They don't like to be pinned down. It's like if you ask me a question, what's heaven like? Well, it's going to be pretty nice. See? So, so, so somebody has been studying Luke. Well, he wrote it someplace between 61 and 64. Well, pinpoint it. Well, 62. I found three commentaries, said the year 62. How many years after Jesus? 30. See that? One generation. So there are still people alive from Jesus' day when Luke is writing this. And Luke, you know, he liked to say, I studied. 
I asked eyewitnesses. I'm telling you what I have seen myself. The author was an artist with words, and you almost have to study Greek to know that. His Greek is what we would call perfect Achaean Greek. John writes Greek, but he writes the common Greek, not high Greek. You know, German's got a high, high German, low German. Uh, Greek isn't quite that distinct, but the Koine, the common Greek, is what we get in most of the Bible. Luke, with the Gospel of Luke and Acts of the Apostles, he's got kind of a pretty high level. We're going to be studying the Apostle Paul later on. Paul is a common Greek. Paul's first eight verses in Romans are one sentence. <laughs> Do you remember when you were in grade school, you had to write a little speech? I got up in the morning and I had breakfast and then I got dressed and then I went to school and then I had to study and then I did my homework and then I said, remember you, all the ands you put in there? I was still doing that in high school and getting all these red marks. <laughs> so that's the way Paul wrote. He's got and, and and. Luke is clever. He doesn't do the and and the and. He goes on with straightway. Uh, this is the King James. Straightway they went. Straightway they did. Immediately they went on. It's the same word always. Straight is literally the word. So rather than saying and, and, well, immediately they got going and then straight away they were ready and afterwards they, but it was all be the same and. <laughs> so Luke messes it up with pretty good Greek. The book of Acts is a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. Obvious, we said that before. Luke has some specific points to convey to Theophilus. Here is kind of the content of the Acts of the Apostles. A history of the early church, Jerusalem. A defense of the faith. He quotes about six sermons. Some sermons of Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter, like on Pentecost. Peter's sermon, uh, you crucified the king of glory, but the Lord raised him from the dead. A guide for Christians of the Christian church of all ages. See, even our call process is going to be a little bit like the way they called a replacement for Judas. I should have brought my other glass. Luke wants us to see how the New Testament church went into all the world, starting in Jerusalem, then going into Judea, spreading out into Samaria, and how it continues to go out into all the world. Written to Theophilus, written from, and I suggest Rome, the city of Rome, well, why didn't he write it in Latin? If he's in Rome, why didn't he write it in Latin? Because he's writing it to his Greek friend. Did I fool you with that question? No. Okay. <laughs> the theme, I don't know if you want to write down this whole thing. The complete story of the church growing from the Ascension Day and on. Or I'll give you my short theme, from Jerusalem to Rome, or simply, the spread of the holy Christian church into all the world. And that's what Matthew said. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every... No, that was Mark. Uh, go and make disciples of all nations. That's Matthew. It's an outline. I don't know if we want to do much with an outline. Uh, I have an easier outline. Part one, Peter. Part two, Paul. Part three, Paul in prison. And that really gives you the Acts of the Apostles. And you see how it's spread out here. The origin of the church, the period of transition, the expansion to the Gentiles, that's Paul. And the imprisonment and defense of Paul. 
Here's some unique features, and if they're unique, they're not in any of the, of the books, and most of these are in other books, so you cross out the word unique. If it's unique, it's one of a kind, and you're not going to find it anyplace else. And if there's one thing I did as an editor of our school paper, if anybody used the word unique, just to say very, you know, this is a unique church, you know, the way the roof... No, it's not unique. I've seen a lot of churches with roofs going up like that. You know what they claim? They claim if you're sitting way in back, you can hear what's going on up front. Can you hear me back there? Okay, I guess that's a good way to build a church. But it's not unique. See, a lot of, a lot of uh, architects will do that. He's got very accurate historical da data. It's his literary excellence with the knowledge of Greece, Greek. He has very dramatic descriptions. And I don't know if you can get a more dramatic sermon like then. You crucified the Lord of glory. Oh, what must we do? Repent and be baptized. That's Luke. And if you read it looking for it, you see that kind of drama. Peter's locked away in jail. He's going to be hauled before the Sanhedrin the next day. He's in jail that night. An angel appears. The chains fall off. The door opens. And he just walks out of prison. And then the next morning when they went to get him, he wasn't there. An objective account he tries to show that he's a historian looking down, not a subjective saying, this is my personal opinion. In fact, most of the Bible claims to be objective. You do have some authors, like Jeremiah, why me, Lord? But most of your Old Testament also is objective. Read Moses. It's history. Moses doesn't hold himself up as a hero. <laughs> he even writes about his own mistakes. The use of the personal pronoun we. And does he list the personal? Okay, I'm on the, on the back page, second page. You might, where it says a personal pronoun, it's the first person, plural, we. And that's when... Uh, Luke is there with the Apostle Peter. It's we. I don't know why I didn't know that till sometime in college. You know, I should have learned that in Sunday school, that Luke was there with, with Paul, because he said we. There is no ending. And I got a quick little side story to tell you. It ends with Paul is released. There are some traditional reports that Paul went to Spain because he wanted to go to Spain, but we don't know he did. So, if you remember Walter A. Meyer used to do the Lutheran Hour? His son, Paul Meyer, is a history professor at Western University of Michigan, Western Michigan University. He has written a book about an archaeologist whose wife found this old, old, old book. It was a Greek copy from the year 300. The oldest copy we have of the Greek was found in Sinai. And so they call it the Sinaiticus uh, book. Another one was found in Constantinople, and it is called the Byzantine text. And... If you find each of these copies, sometimes they're kind of a, the story's a little bit different because over the years there's different places. This architect's wife finds this Constantine Codus because history says Constantine, when he was the emperor in Constantinople, you call it Byzantium? Is that right? Is that the same as Byzantium today? Constantinople? He took a church historian by the name of Eusebius 
and said, Eusebius, I want you to get 50 copies of the New Testament written. And it sounded expensive. And he didn't want it on ordinary uh, paper. He wanted on parchment. And he wanted good solid covers. Architects have a dream of someday finding one of those 50 old copies in Greek. Which if it was written in the year 300, that's about as close as you can get to the year 62. And that means it hasn't been copied all the time. It's close to the original. So Paul Meyer wrote, when they started looking at the Greek, they found out it's got an end to the Acts of the Apostles. So the church had to debate. Are you going to have an Acts 2? Are you going to add three chapters to Acts? And the whole story goes, with, well, look at it. It's, it's Paul goes to Spain, and then Paul revisits the churches he's been at before, and then Paul, all the things that tradition thinks Paul did, uh, Paul Meyer wrote it into his book, and it's called the Constantine Codex. And I just finished reading it again last week. It's about a three-day read, if you ever go to the library, Constantine Codex. Very well written. And it's all these ideas of what they find when they're archaeologists. He wrote one where they found a skeleton. And the archaeologists claimed it's a skeleton of Jesus. See, the man was crucified. You can see the marks where the nail was and in the feet. Well, they found out it was just an ordinary crucifixion that the guy was buried. So there's a lack of an ending. Now that we know that there's no ending, let's go to the beginning. Week one, we again have the theme, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So, Pentecost is going to be one of the first stories. It's next week. Chapter two gets us into next week. Let's look at I'm a little bit debated on this. I've got a bunch of notes that I can do going through book one. And you have some of those notes, like uh, 40 days of waiting. 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 Waiting for the... Jesus said, stay in Jerusalem and wait till the Holy Spirit is poured upon you. I thought this might make more sense if to spend less time with that piece of paper and take the Acts of the Apostles. And I think I'm going to do the reading. Not because that puts it on the screen better, but because I'm reading not a translation, but a paraphrase. This is called Good News for Modern Man. And I've always said, this is not a translation. It's kind of a translating with explanation the way I think it might have been. But I've also compared it to the Greek, which will be compared to the Acts that you have. So you might want to keep the Bible open, and you will hear the differences, and I will try to explain the differences. Dear Theophilus, oh, that's a good way to start a letter. You know how the Apostle Paul started all of his letters? Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the believers who are in Rome. Well, this is a personal history, not a letter. This isn't somebody writing home to Grandma and saying, Grandma, we won our softball game. No, this is a history lesson for his dear friend, a very educated leader, because in Luke... He calls Theophilus most excellent Theophilus. That's a title you give to a judge. That's a title you give to Mr. President. See? Here he doesn't have that. Theophilus has been a Christian. He doesn't 
come up to him and say, Oh, most excellent Theophilus, you're such a great guy, and now I'd like to write to you. Nope. Listen, brother. Here's what I got to tell you. In my first book, Luke, I wrote about all the things that Jesus did and taught from the time he began his work, and actually Luke started when he was born. came to pass in those days that went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and there was no room in the inn, and she brought forth her firstborn son. That's Luke. Luke actually starts in chapter 1 with the promise of John the Baptist, and then the birth of John the Baptist. So it goes, starts, the first one starts before he began his work. Until the day he was taken up to heaven, Luke ends with the ascension. Well, just a very simple, and he blessed, he stood on the Mount of, of uh, Olives and he blessed them and he ascended into heaven. And the disciples went back into Jerusalem rejoicing. That's the way Luke ended. You almost got the feeling Luke wasn't done. By the time he wrote Luke Gospel, he already has in his mind, and I'm going to keep writing as things happen. Before he was taken up, he gave instructions by the power of the Holy Spirit to the men he had chosen, and there's only 11 left. Remember where Judah, Judas, Judas is gone? Well, Luke's going to take care of that. He had chosen them, and those 12 were called apostles. You are disciples. We are disciples of Christ. There were only 12 apostles. The word apostle is sent. And so those that were commissioned and sent are the only ones the New Testament calls apostles. Paul called himself an apostle because on the road to Damascus, Jesus said, I am making you my messenger to the Gentiles. For 40 days they're waiting. After his death, he showed himself to them many times and in many ways. And I was going to put together the many times and the many ways that the Apostle Paul gives you in 1 Corinthians. And then I thought, no, Pastor Henning is going to do that if he studies Corinthians. So I thought I'd give you, from my mind, the appearances of the Lord Jesus that proves that he rose again. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to the women on the way from the tomb, and from the empty tomb. He appeared to the disciples when Thomas wasn't there. Then he appeared to the disciples with Thomas. And Thomas, the skeptic, says, My Lord and my God, he is my Savior alive again. And he appeared to Peter. And he appeared to two men on the road to Emmaus. And then he appeared to the Apostle Paul. We're told he appeared to James. Not the Apostle James. Son of Zebedee. James, the brother of Jesus who, and we're going to find out in the Acts of the Apostles, becomes the leader, the bishop of Jerusalem. And then he appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. At one time he appeared to over 500 at one time. And when Paul wrote this, he says, and many of those 500 are still alive now. So if Paul told Luke about 500 living witnesses to Christ... Luke very likely talked to some of those 3,000 that were baptized that one day. He would have talked to Peter because he has a whole story of Peter's sermon. And then I kind of wonder, was Luke there? People were there from all over the world at Pentecost. Did Luke hear that sermon? And that's what he's going to write for us to read. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift, my Father promised. I will send the Holy Spirit unto you, and he will teach you the truth. For John baptized with water in a few days. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you and I were baptized, and you've seen babies baptized 
in the name of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit was there. The baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Acts of the Apostles was an empowering. We know several things about that empowering. Whatever they said, it was understood in every language. Now, we don't know the miracle. Did they speak all the languages? Or did people just hear in their own language? See, I think the miracle of the Holy Spirit was they could all understand Peter when he preached in Greek or Aramaic. I don't think he preached in Hebrew. Hebrew was only used in the synagogue. Aramaic was the language of the street. Greece, or Greek, was the language of the, of the world. The Holy Roman Empire, the Greco-Roman world. Uh, Alexander the Great spread Greece all the way to India. And we hear the Apostle Thomas went to India. And I don't think he had, had to learn Farsi. I think what he did is he speak in Greek. He, would, he believed and spoke in Greek. The words come too slowly. Somebody told me it's not wrong to have a pause once in a while. See, you thought that was a good, that was a good pause because you all paid attention. Right? <laughs> Ascension day, verse 6. The apostles met together with Jesus and said, Lord, are you going to now establish the kingdom of, of Israel? Are we going to have you as the new Solomon? Are you going to be the new King David and drive out the Romans? Are you going to establish the kingdom of heaven and we will sit with you on thrones ruling over a universal kingdom? Uh, by the way, the millennialists today still think Jesus is going to come back and do that. Jesus is going to come back and set up his empire on earth. He never said that. Watch for the answer. The times and the occasions are set by my Father's own authority. And it is not for you to know when they will be. It's a good thing that you do not know that Jesus is coming back tomorrow. If you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, you wouldn't be here. You'd be home packing. Right? Ready to go. My Father knows when the last day will be, but Jesus standing on earth said that's his, his prerogative. Jesus, in his human nature, said I'm coming back, but he didn't say when. You will be filled with power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that sentence, a lot of people said, is the theme of the Acts of the Apostles. And you see the spreading, right? Jerusalem, the city. Judea, the area. Samaria, the next area. And then keep on going to Syria, Asia Minor, Greece, Rome, England, America. Well, Luke didn't go that far. My pastor said, you want to try something someday? He said, go downtown Phoenix, stand by the highest building, just stand there and look. You know what will happen? People will stop alongside of you and they're all looking. And he said, that's what happened when Jesus went up. After he said this, he was taken up into heaven the ascension, as they watched him, a cloud hid him from their sight. That means physically, with his human body born of Mary, the body that was crucified and rose again glorified, went up until a cloud came in. Well, it almost looks like heaven's up there then. Well, you don't know. It's on the other side of the cloud. In my sermon, I said, you can close your... See, see what heaven looks like? See? We can uncover the cloud. Just take what Scripture says about the glory of heaven. Okay. 
they still had their eyes fixed on the sky as he went away. When two men dressed in white, there were two men at the empty tomb telling the women he's risen again. Angels. Two men dressed in white. Angels. Men of Galilee. See, all the disciples came from Galilee. None of the disciples came from Jerusalem. Boy, the Pharisees couldn't stand that. This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. And Jesus told Caiaphas, the Son of Man will come in the clouds of heaven. See? The clouds. So when Jesus comes back, there'll be a nice cloudy day. It'll be like yesterday. I saw a rainbow and it wasn't raining. I thought maybe that's, no, no, I wanted to teach this class first. Could that cloud have been the commode on the line? No. No. This cloud is meant to be just a, you see it every day. No. The kavod on an eye is, is, is so glorious that, that the apostles had to hide their eyes, remember? And when you see the signs of the end, look up. You wouldn't do that if it was the kavod on an eye, okay? That's a pretty good question there. Because look up. You will see him coming. Just like these 11 men saw him go. Uh -huh, that's the way it is. When you're having fun, the clock just runs. Ever notice that? I was reading the other night. That I think I started reading about 6.30. It was almost 9. I can hardly get out of my chair after sitting two hours. Judas's successor. This is an interesting comparison for the way you and I go to a call meeting and we vote on a new pastor. Then the apostles went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is about a half a mile away from the city. They entered Jerusalem and went to the upper room where they were staying. That's probably not where they had the Lord's Supper. That was an upper room prepared for a meal. This seems to be an upstairs motel room. Uh, we're familiar with the inns. The inns were all on ground level, mostly in a tent. But there were, throughout Jerusalem, what you would call holiday lodging. Uh, one of our pastors liked to always talk about Holiday Inn. Oh, they went to the second story of the Holiday Inn. The Jerusalem Holiday Inn. Look at the names. Peter, Simon Peter, also known as Cephas. John and James, James and John are the sons of Zebedee, of Zebedee, their brothers. Andrew was Peter's brother. Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, who is also named Nathaniel. Bartholomew has another name, which is a Hebrew name, Nathaniel. Bartholomew, they guess, was Aramaic. Cephas was Aramaic. Peter was Greek. Here's another Simon. He's called the Patriot or the Zealot. There were terrorists in those days, and Simon was in a terrorist cell. We think that's who Barnabas was. Barnabas was committed murder in the rebellion. We think Barnabas was a zealot. James, here's another James. This one's the son of Alphaeus, not the son of Zebedee. Oop, I got one out of order. Judas, also known as Thaddeus. In order to, dis Matthew, in order to not use the name Judas again, used the name Thaddeus, son of James. They all joined together in a group to pray frequently. They met together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. What you'd expect if John, the son of Zebedee,
who's told, take care of my mother, take care of Mary. You'd expect Mary to be right here by John. And his brothers, two of his brothers wrote books of the New Testament. James and Jude. Jude in Greek is actually Judas. But the Christians didn't want to have a book named Judas. I don't blame them. So they call his short story or short letter Jude, Book of Jude. James is fairly short. It's a letter sent to the, the Hebrew people to show that we're not saved by works. Remember the big problem with the Pharisees? They thought you had to keep all these commandments. You had to be circumcised. You had to obey the Sabbath. You can't go to heaven unless you do all these works. Paul was very careful saying, no, that doesn't work. But that's what James wrote. It's not by works. You do the works, but you're not saved by works. Verse 15, if you're with me. A few days later, there was a meeting of the believers, about 120 well, Jesus appeared to 500 at one time. And here we got about 120 living in Jerusalem. That number shouldn't surprise us. So then in a couple of weeks, in, in 10 more days, Pentecost, there's 3,000 believers. So to jump from 120 to 3,000 is not as big a jump as from 11 to 3,000. Not that that matters much. The Holy Spirit works where he will. Peter stood up to speak. He's the leader. Remember, Peter was always the first one to answer questions. Who do people say I am? Oh, you're Christ, the Son of the living God, Peter says. So he stands up as the leader of the eleven. The scriptures had to come true, which said, in which the Holy Spirit said, speaking through David, he predicted about Judas, who was the guide of the men who arrested Jesus, Judas Iscariot, Judas the traitor, Judas who betrayed his Lord. Judas was a member of our group. He was one of the twelve. Judas was an apostle. Judas walked with Jesus for three years. Traitor. He was a Judas. You ever notice that? You don't name your son Judas. That's a good name. It's the Old Testament Judah. I hear pastors name their kids Judah once in a while, but you don't name them Judas. If I called you a Judas, that's about a bad a, a, bad a name I could call some. I, I, I'm not, no, I, uh, hey, take that back. I did not call her Judas. You heard the if. This was a demonstration. With the money, 30 pieces of silver, Judas got for his evil act. He bought a field where he fell to his death. He burst open and all his insides spilled out. You know, we know he hung himself. We don't know why in hanging himself it was such an ugly thing where his, his, his center part of his body just fell apart. So the idea is he hung himself from a high spot and jumped way down a cliff. And it was so bad that when he hit, his, his insides spilled up. This is the only thing we know about it. That's all I'm going to say. A horrible death. All the people living in Jerusalem heard about that story. And so in their own language, they called it in Aramaic, Akaldam, Ak, hold on, Akaldama which means field of blood. For it's written in the book of Psalms, may his house become empty, let no one live in it. It's also written, may someone else take his place in service. No one else is going to become one of the twelve that Jesus sent. But the apostles are going to pick one that they will send. So watch the call meeting. This is the call meeting in the year 30 A.D. Probably was about the first week in June. So then a man must join us as 
has been a witness to the resurrection. Here's got to be somebody who was in Jerusalem and saw the living Jesus. You know, we know one time there were 70 disciples that were sent out. And we know there were 500 that saw the living Jesus. So they're getting a call list. Peter puts the call list together, not the district president. I don't think they had district presidents. Someone who was with us the whole time that the Lord Jesus traveled about with us. Remember how large crowds followed him wherever he went? It wasn't just the 12 disciples. There was large crowd. So there's others hanging around that hear Jesus. From the time John preached his baptism, so before Jesus began his ministry, and this will assume somebody that was baptized by John the Baptist. So he's already known as the sect of the Nazarene. That's what the Romans called him. The Christians were called the sect of the Nazarene. They proposed two men. Joseph, who was called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice. Here you have a man with three names, and everybody must have known him, his three names. He wasn't chosen. You never hear about justice again. And the other man, he was down the list, I guess, on the call list, Matthias. So now they got to choose. How are they going to choose? They prayed. You ever notice? We have a prayer before every call meeting starts. Lord, you know the hearts of all men. And Lord, you show us which one of these two you have chosen to take a place of service as an apostle, going to be a sent one, which Judas left to go to the place where he belongs. Well, where does a suicide betrayer of Jesus belong? Depart from me, Jesus would say to him on the last day. After this, they drew lots. Do we vote that way when we call a pastor? Did you draw lots? See, there, there could be, I would use marbles. The red marble would be the guy from Minnesota. The, the green marble would be somebody from California. You know, there might even be a man here from Arizona. We'll make that the black marble. Yeah. You know why? You call someone from Arizona, Pastor Buchel is going to have another vacancy to take care of, see? I think that's smart he doesn't tell us to call somebody from Arizona. Oh, wait a minute. Glendale, Arizona, just called a man from Reno. That's our district. If, if the man from Reno leaves, Pastor Buchholz has to go to Reno for a call meeting. What was he thinking? I know what he was thinking. A very good man to fit the needs of Grace Glendale... Is that man right now up there in Reno? That's what he was thinking. They drew lots to choose between two. So, there are lots of ways in those days they drew lots. How did the soldiers cast lots for Jesus' clothing? Remember, his robe was one piece. Let's cast lots. We don't have to tear it into four pieces. Well, they probably said, you know, there's a lot of rocks here on Calvary. Let's get four different colored rocks or put names on them. And then we'll shake and shake and shake until one pops out. You know, they do that at, at bingo, right? You know, bingo, and, you know, A7 or whatever. Matthias. Now, casting lots was also sometimes... Draw the long straw or the short straw. The last time we were at call meeting, after the first vote, two names were tied. So Pastor Henning could have said, well, how about let's just draw straws? You know, the long straw will be Pastor Calm, and the short straw will be the other guy. I don't remember the other names. Up. Oh. 
Pastor, come. And it is the Lord, the Holy Spirit, guiding the process. There are times when we have really decided something we should do. I should study for the ministry. Heads I'll go ministry, tails I'll go scientist. Though no, probably carpenter. If I wouldn't be a pastor, I'd be a carpenter like my dad was. My dad was a good carpenter. There are houses all over Glendale that my dad built. I could show you some pictures of my dad's houses because I lived in about five of them. Sometimes mom complained about the time she was getting used to the new house, you sold it, and we had to move to the garage for a while. Okay. That's not in Acts of the Apostles. That's, that's an Acts of Bill Wagon Connect. Okay. The name chosen was that of Matthias, and he was added to the group of the eleven. Okay, you can do this. Take eleven and add one more. What do you get? Twelve, twelve, okay. So now we have twelve apostles. You and I are disciples. We're not apostles. Except when we commission a missionary to go into Vietnam. Isn't that amazing? Big seminary in Vietnam. They graduated 55 pastors. Why couldn't we get at least one of those? There are only 37 in that one, right? Pastor Buchholz did not put any of those Vietnamese pastors on our call list. Okay. See, a pause accomplishes something. And that means we're ready in ten more days. The disciples are waiting. Do you think they were doing nothing in Jerusalem? I'll tell you what they were doing. They were telling all over town, Jesus is risen. We have a Savior. The Messiah has come. And it's just a few days after Pentecost, <laughs> the Pharisees convinced the Sanhedrin to arrest Peter and John and put them in jail. So Peter and John were the first of the disciples to be put in jail. Except John the Baptist was put in jail before Jesus was even crucified. Do you have any questions on chapter 1? The opening of the Acts of the Apostles. Now, if we had time, I could probably, I've probably got about 30 minutes more material. If, are you hungry? <laughs> I, are you hungry? Go have lunch. But you can replay this and get some of these details. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the friend, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us forever. Amen.